Uh, so today I'm going to talk about how AI is actually data and what that means when you start to build a virtual assistant, um, with a caveat that this is uh, focused on the, the Raza way of building virtual assistants. So a question I get kind of a lot whenever I tell people what I do for work is um, some variation of why do you bother working on chatbots? And the subtext there is generally that the person I'm talking to doesn't like conversational AI projects. They've had some bad experiences. They didn't have a good time. Uh, and that has led me to think a lot about what makes them not work. And very fundamentally, I think that a conversational AI project isn't helpful when it doesn't help people do what they need to do and ideally do what they need to do faster than they could any other way. That's what makes, you know, if you've ever just had a really delightful chatbot experiences, it's because it was very fast, it was very easy, it was very natural, and you were in and out of there and done. So how do you know what people need to do? Uh, several approaches to doing this. So one would be making an educated guess. Uh, another one would be doing UX research and asking people and talking about them and, and watching them walk through their work processes. Um, or you could look at the data and sort of use that to infer what people's needs are. So I would say that the educated guess approach is um, sort of the, the traditional way of building conversational assistants, um, using complete top-down design, designing all the pathways that you need, everything that somebody would want to do, you have ready by the time the bot is launched. Uh, and there are definitely situations where this is a good approach. So something that comes to mind in the little example here um, is from video game dialogue trees, where you want to have people have basically the same conversation every time. Uh, but they are really inflexible. Uh, UX research, I'm not a UX researcher. I see there are some UX researchers in the audience today. Y'all are rock stars. Um, not my thing. If you can do UX research during your bot development and design and into production and improving it over time, please, please do. But I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, and finally, you can look at people's data to figure out what it is that they need to do. So the biggest benefit of this is that if you're using modern machine learning methods, um, like we do at Raza, you get a really flexible assistant where you can do things in different orders, where you can phrase things in different ways, and it will still work. Uh, but the, the caveat there is that that doesn't mean that all you need is a bunch of user-generated data. So I've been using Tay, uh, the chatbot, as an example for, for a couple of years now. And just this year, unfortunately, there was another situation where a chatbot that was built using user-generated data uh, ended up having you know, really negative impact. So uh, Liluda was a chatbot. And... Uh, very soon after launching, started to say some, you know, kind of bigoted stuff. Uh, and also uh, some NLP researchers found that with, you know, not that much effort, you could actually get the training data it was trained on back out of it. So things like account names uh, and people's addresses that they had used in the training data. So that that's no good. So I would suggest a happy medium where your system learns from data, you get that flexibility, but you provide additional structure and organization to make sure that you don't get any unexpected negative bad side effects. When I say data in this context, what is it that I mean? So the data in conversational AI is almost always text data. The majority of it is going to be in pre-training models. And you will probably not touch this while you're developing your first assistant. Uh, but this is the corpus used to pre-train things like language models, things like word embeddings, um, the data that was used to learn the features that you take to turn text into numbers. Again, you're probably not going to have to mess with that on your first assistant. What's more relevant is user-generated text, so things that users have said or written to a system, uh, and patterns of conversation, so what order have things happened in in the past. And a really good example of this would be customer support logs. Um, so maybe somebody's chatting with a customer support agent, and if your privacy policy allows for it, talk to a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. You could use that as your training data for your assistant. Uh, and I'm not going to talk a lot about code here. And the fact is that you don't actually need to change a lot of machine learning code to write a really good assistant. Most assistants will have more or less the same underlying machine learning code. That's why you can build something like Raza. That's why a conversational AI framework is possible and why you don't have to be a machine learning expert in order to build an assistant. The thing that is really important and you do have to be an expert in is your data and what your users need to do and how they communicate what they need to do. So 
putting aside the sort of like high level stuff, let's get down to the really, really practical advice. What do you do? What steps should you take? So I'm going to talk about intents, um, how to start working with intents if you already have data, some approaches that will work even if you don't have data, stories, and then how to check if it works. So intents, I like to think of them as something a user wants to do that they're going to communicate to you in a turn of a conversation. Um, and the, the little litmus test that I recommend is when you're trying to add a new intent, or you're looking at intents, ask yourself, is this a verb or is it like mostly a verb? If you had to come up with a name for the thing that somebody wanted to do, would it be a doing thing or would it be some pieces of information or maybe like half a sentence or a lot of other nouns that you need to tack on at the end to distinguish it from other intents? Uh, and I'll talk about I know a bit about why that's a little bit dangerous. So if you have user data, how do you know what your intents are? I would recommend using a modified content analysis for your first pass at figuring out what your intents are. So content analysis is a qualitative research technique from um, a lot of corpus studies use it. And uh, the way that it would work is you go through your data or a sample of your data for each utterance, for each turn, assign that to a intent category. If there isn't one that fits yet, add a new one. So you would obviously start by adding your first one to a new category. And then at given intervals, maybe every hour, maybe, you know, when you've looked at 100 points or something, uh, go through, reevaluate your groups, combine them, separate them, uh, and then go with through your data set two or three times when you do this, just so you have an idea that, yeah, these are pretty stable groups. I can usually agree with which uh, intent this needs to go into. Now, especially if you have a lot more machine learning background, you may be wondering, well, couldn't you automate this with some sort of unsupervised uh, text clustering method? Uh, maybe. I will say it's a hard problem in and of itself, uh, particularly evaluating the clusters and seeing if they are good. Um, and the biggest problem is there's no guarantee that the clusters that you automatically generate will actually map to things that the user wants to do, right? And our, our, main, our main goal here is to help people do the things they need to do. So even if you don't have data, um, these next steps will work. So the first thing to focus on, uh, if you do have your intents from your content, al content analysis, this still applies, is start with your most common intent. So in a conversation or a series of conversations, the things that people want to do are not going to be uniformly distributed across all the things somebody might want to do. So for example, just thinking about it in real life, uh, somebody is probably not going to propose marriage once in every single conversation, right? Uh, even though it may be very important when they do. Uh, and this uneven distribution means that you can get a lot of mileage out of starting with the things that happen most often. And I would really recommend using the expert in your institution. Um, so uh, especially people like support staff, these are our, you know, trained, knowledgeable experts. They can help you out. Um, a really good example of this from um, when I was at Kaggle is that uh, our customer support team got about 80% of the tickets that they had to deal with were dealing with a single issue. So if we had a conversational assistant that could handle one issue really well, we would have dramatically improved uh, the lives of our support staff. Uh, and once you have the most common intent, Continue to add, but add really conservatively. You want the smallest possible number of intents uh, that you can have to, to minimally address the things that your users are going to need to do when you start testing. Uh, and everything else, so if you're like, well, there's like these five or six things people might want to do, especially if you have examples of those, stick those in an out of scope intent. And when that's detected, have a thing that you do where you're like, hey, I noticed you're trying to do something that we can't do right now. Here's like the page to go to to find more information, or here's the contact information for the person you need to talk to, or here's the phone number you need to call. So you get people out of the assistant right away if the assistant isn't going to be able to help them. Uh, and additional intents will come over time, oops, sorry, from user data. Why fewer intents? So there's definitely a style of conversational design where you have an intent for everything your user wants to do, and you figure those all out before you start launching your assistant. That's not the style uh, that we use here at Raza. With conversation-driven development, you've probably heard about in other uh, talks as well, you start with what is most popular, what you absolutely need, and have a way to handle things that aren't in that course of intents, and then add them if people actually need them. So you're spending your time on what people are using and what they're trying to do. Why is it also a good idea to have fewer intents? So on the human side, the more intents you have, the more training data you need, the more maintenance it takes, uh, and the more documentation, because you need to 
tell you know everyone who's working on your assistant what are the each of these intents are supposed to be doing um, and that is much easier to do if you have 10 tents 10 intents than if you have 10,000 intents and similarly, when you're going through and you're using Raza X and you're annotating your user turns, it's much easier to correctly assign or check if something is you know, correctly uh, sorted into 10 bins than 10,000 bins. Uh, and then on the machine learning side, transformer classifiers scale linearly with the number of classes. So increasing the number of classes uh, you know, increases the, the cost and time of your uh, assistance training. Uh, an NTHC instruction, particularly if you're using like very lightweight rule-based systems, can often be faster. So how do you pare down intents? The number one anti-pattern I see uh, newer Raza developers using when they start to design intents is that they store information in intents. So earlier when I mentioned an intent should be a verb, not you know a noun phrase that includes a bunch of additional pieces of information, uh, this is what I'm talking about. So if you have a piece of information you need to store that will change the course of the conversation, put that in a slot. It does not necessarily need to come from an entity, but it might. Slots are what you use to uh, keep track of pieces of information, not intent names. Uh, so an example here is I have two intents, booking a train and booking a plane. And if you look at the, the tokens here, the words, you'll notice that there's a lot of overlap in these two uh, sets of tokens between these two intents. So I would recommend combining these into a single intent, like make booking, and then pick out the, the tokens that are important for figuring out what to do next as entities, and then save those. Uh, and my just very general rule of thumb, because I do get asked this, uh, is before you get uh, your assistant in front of user, I would maximally have around 10 intents and around 20 pieces of training data per intent, just as a, a floor to start from. And you can always add more if they're, if they're needful. Uh, the training data for an intent, if you have it, use user-generated data. So if you did your content analysis, use the groups you use from your content analysis and take that and use that as your training data. Um, if you have to create synthetic data, so try to imagine what people might say or you know, use paraphrasing, that can be helpful, but user-generated is better. Uh, just a note, chat-based interactions, certainly in the English communities that I'm part of, tend to be more informal. So if I just have a bunch of examples that look like I'm writing for you know, the Wall Street Journal, uh, they're probably not going to be a very good uh, sample of what my users are actually going to say. And these uh, examples over here are actually from Sarah. So this is user-generated data. Uh, also, every utterance in your training data should unambiguously match to a single intent. So if a piece of text like these bottoms, these things at the bottom down here, good day or ciao or aloha, which could be used both to greet and to say goodbye, show up, I would not put those in the intent training data. I would put those in end-to-end -end learning, um, which is where you have the conversation. And instead of having an intent for a turn, you just have the raw text of what the user said. Uh, and if you want to verify that things are unambiguous, you can use humans to sort it and have multiple people do it and then use uh, a measure like inter-rater reliability to see how much agreement they have. All right, that was most of the talk on intents. Uh, and definitely the older style of conversational design. Most of your work is going to be trying to figure out what happens in what order. Not so much with Raza uh, and our sort of newer style of conversational design. So uh, stories, which are little, little patterns of conversation, are training data to help your assistant decide what to do next. And if the assistant sa sees exactly what it saw in the training data, it'll do that. And if you see something sort of like what it saw in the training data, it will extrapolate from there. Um, so you don't need to have, uh, if, you're, if you're using a system like Raza, every single conversational path mapped out. And in fact, trying to do that will probably uh, just make you unhappy <laughs> and be a lot of unnecessary work. So where do you get them? If you have conversational data, um, start with the patterns that you see there, with the things you want your system to do. Uh, when you find a new intent or something that you think is like, oh, yeah, I see a lot of this pattern in my conversational data. People want to do this a lot. Add that to your intents. Go through the previous steps. Uh, and then for generating new conversational patterns, my recommendation is to use interactive learning, which is where you uh, talk with your Raza assistant. And uh, the, the conversation throughout it, you annotate it and correct the classifications. And then you save that as training data. And then you retrain. 
uh, starting with the most common things, the things you want people to be able to do, uh, then adding errors that you see or that you think might come up. Uh, and as soon as possible, as soon as your assistant is actually usable, get it in front of users. They could be test users on your team. At Raza, we, uh, internally, we tend to send each other links to our assistants <laughs> and be like, hey, can you try talking to us for a bit just so we can see how it works? Um, or they could be you know, test users, uh, but you are, you're never going to be able to guess all the things somebody might want to be able to do with your assistant. So user data is top. Uh, and if you do need more complex conditional logic in your conversations, then when you can start looking at rules, but I wouldn't start with rules. All right, Rachel, I've done all this work. How will I know if it actually created a usable product? Uh, the number, number, number one way is by reviewing user conversations, by looking at what people say to your assistant and being like, yes, they seem happy, or mm, I don't think this conversation went in a way that was very successful for this user, uh, and then adjusting your assistant to improve over time. Uh, other ways, tests. So tests are... Um, in the Rasa context, sample conversations, you know that they should always happen in a certain order. All of the intent should be uh, identified a certain way. Tests you want to be 100% correct. Model validation is more from the machine learning world and it's checking that your model can guess pretty well. And if somebody told me that they could guess something 100% accurately, I'd be a little bit suspicious. And the same goes for models. You do not want 100% accuracy on your validation. Um, especially if you're starting with like 20 pieces of training data per intent above like 98, I'd start to get suspicious that you might be overfitting. So tests, 100%, validation high, probably not 100. So main takeaways, I know this has been a little bit of a little bit of a whirlwind, but language data is what makes your Rasa assistant work. Um, working with language data, sorting it, annotating it is the core and the bulk of the work that you need to do to get your assistant off the ground. Providing structure for that language data is the first step for building NLP systems. Uh, and that goes for Rasa assistants, but that also goes for something like, um, you know, training features. First, you need to have a corpus. The corpus needs to be organized in a certain way. Um, and if there's ever an NLP project where you are not working with data first uh, and it's a deep learning project, it's because somebody else has already done that work for you ahead of time. Start with the fewest possible, most popular things, the most likely conversation flows, the most likely intents, add things as they're needed. And you'll know that they're needed because you're getting your prototype in front of users as soon as possible, right away, um, getting user data in there and making sure that it works.